Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? You hear me okay? Yes. Uh, can you hear me well, or do you think it's better for me to use the uh, mic? Oh no, you sound great. Okay. Then so whichever. Mm -hmm. I um I have my headphones in just because sound travels in the office. Mm -hmm. So I'm making you the host, and uh, we have some people in the waiting room. Uh, can I do co-host? This should be fun. <laughs> Never done this before. Yeah, and, and you know, last time we had a really uh, engaged audience. So what we did was we kept everybody on mute until like the Q&A part, then I unmuted it. But we asked them to kind of keep it muted until they had a question because it becomes chaos when everybody opens up their um, computers. You hear a lot of background noise. Okay. Um, so um, does it mean that I should finish my, kind of my, my talk and then do Q and A. Is yeah. that a better setup? Okay. Yeah. But um, I can open up Johannes's, and if there's anybody else's, just so if you have questions or you know you want him to jump in on something, he can be open. But mm -hmm. um, for the most part, I'll keep the audience closed. Okay, sounds good. So um, time wise, so I guess we could do. I guess I can finish within like forty or like thirty minutes or so. So that'll leave us enough time for discussion, I think. Absolutely, that should be. And he, uh, Johannes usually does like a brief introduction. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. We actually have people waiting in the waiting room already. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to close my camera so they just see you when it's time because my desk area is a mess. Uh, you know what? I intentionally use this side because that's not, I don't want people to see it. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, uh, I'm looking on camera like, oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm, uh, um, I have to edit a document, but I'm still here. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. So I'll, yeah, I, I guess I can put on my slide. Okay. And I'll do share screen after. Okay. I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm
Johannes, can you hear us? Hi, Johannes. I don't think we can hear you. Hi, I'm here. I, I oh, was uh, I was just uh, away from the computer. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm here. I just to listen in. All right. So I could start letting people in. And do you want to give it about five minutes before we uh, start? Yep, that makes sense. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Johannes Urpelainen from the ERA program at ICEP. We're just going to give it another three, four minutes to make sure that everybody who wants to join is able to do so, and then we'll get started with Wei's uh, presentation. I think now would be a good time to get started. Let's make sure that we have enough time for the presentation and discussion. So uh, welcome everybody to the ICEP and ERE webinar. Uh, my name is Johannes Urpelan and I'm the director of the ERE program and the founding director of ICEP uh, here at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And uh, today I'm very pleased to have uh, Wei Peng from uh, Penn State who is going to tell us about China's climate change and uh, air pollution uh, issues. Wait, please. Okay, thank you. So, um, hi everyone, my name is Wei Pan. I'm the only one who turned on video, so I guess there's no confusion about who I am. 
Um, so I'm very excited to do my first ever webinar. Um, it's great that we can do it in a low carbon way, but on the other hand, I would suggest that um, it's good for me to finish my presentation and then have a Q&A in the end. So um, we won't get like too many people turn on the, the mic simultaneously. So with that, let me put up my slide and share my screen with you. Okay. Okay, can everyone see the slide? Yes. Okay, thank you, Johannes. Yeah, great. So um, I will just get started. Um, I'm going to talk about integrating air quality, water, and climate concerns into China's energy strategy. Uh, and I'm now at the Penn State University. I have a joint appointment between the School of National Affairs and Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. So in the talk, you will see that there will be part of uh, the presentation, I'll be wearing an engineer hat, telling you how quantitatively we do the assessment. But there is a, that other section of the presentation, I'm going to wear a policy expert hat and try to figure out what can we tell the policymakers. So let's get started. And let's see if I can make it smaller. Okay, good. Okay. But before I go into the details, I want to ask a bigger question. What is it like to have high economic growth? To me, it means that every time I go back to my home city, a city called Changsha in Southern China, there are always new buildings, new roads, new convention centers, and also new shopping malls. And in just 10 years of, of time, we got a new airport terminal for international travel, we got a new train station for high-speed trains, and we also got uh, a, three metro lines running in the city, and this all happened within one decade. And Changsha is only a second-tier city in China. If we look at the larger cities like Shanghai, that was Shanghai in 1987, and this is Shanghai today. So you could see that this economic transformation has been really phenomenal in China. And this is the background for every story we tell about this country, including growing pains. So arguably China is the world worst polluter. It is the top carbon emitter. It has very severe air pollution that leads to uh, millions of premature deaths every year. And water has become an increasingly important issue in the past 10 decades, both in terms of water stress and water quality. So what is behind this economic growth and all the environmental problems? Energy. And for China, mostly coal. In order to support this economic miracle, the energy consumption has been increasing rapidly in the past three, four decades. And coal, which is the darker brown line here, remains to be the dominant form of energy. So we know that burning coal, on the one hand, emits CO2 emissions and also carbon emissions, um, as carbon emissions as well as air pollutant emissions. And on the, on the other hand, a lot of coal uh, energy-related activities also consumes water. For example, coal power plants need water for cooling unless they use more advanced technologies such as air for cooling. So, if, if we think about the future, um, you will see that there's a different trend in places like China compared with like United States. And this pink line down here is the projected electric demand for the United States. You will see that the demand is projected to grow, but not by too much. In comparison for countries like China, which the yellow line here, the electric demand is projected to grow very rapidly in the coming decade. What does it mean? It means that hundreds of new power plants need to be built. But are we going to build more coal power plants, which is cheaper, but dirtier, both in, both in terms of air pollution, carbon, and water consumption? Or are we going to build more wind and solar power plants, which are still, uh, which are cleaner, but on a levelized cost basis, still more expensive? And this is the key question of all of my research. I really focus on this nexus of energy and environment. To me, 
energy is always at the center of sustainability because the way we use energy determines how much carbon emissions we're going to emit, how much air pollution are going to be are going to occur, and also how much water consumption um, we're going to consume. But I also want to highlight that climate change is a global concern. In comparison, many of the other concerns are local, such as air pollution and water. And to most people, worries about global warming are less pressing than worries about clean air and city, uh, clean air and water in their home cities. In other words, these local concerns carry much more weight than global concerns in shaping people's energy preferences. So the key question is really how should we design energy strategies so that we can simultaneously address this local and global sustainability concerns? Of course, this is a very difficult question. What I'm going to do today is to give you two examples based on our own research, one from the demand side, um, and we use the example of electric vehicles, and the other from supply side, and we use the example of electricity generation and transmission. So let's start with the demand side example first. So if we look at the electric cars market, China is really the leader. Um, this, on this figure, I'm showing you the electric vehicle market, um, estimated plug-in electric vehicle sales in the United States and China in the past seven years or so. So you could see the trend in China, the red bar here, is really increasing rapidly. And since 2016, China has become the largest market for electric vehicles. In addition to that, um, in 2017, China proposed an intention to ban the internal combustion engine. Right now, the government is at the stage of um, really formalizing the plan and finding the test cities or provinces um, to move this forward. But you could imagine that if the country really implemented this policy, this is going to be a game changer, not only for the domestic market, but also for the international market, because this would really China to a large extent will decide how large will be the demand. So we ask ourselves, given that there is a growing trend for electric vehicles, and we know that by having electric vehicles, we can reduce gasoline consumption in the transportation sector and also reduce the associated air pollution and carbon emissions. We ask ourselves, what could potentially happen in 2030? Um, what does it mean for, if we have more electric cars on the road, what does it mean for air pollution and also for the climate? So the way we do it is to use an integrated assessment method in order to evaluate the air quality, health, and CO2 emissions. And I'm going to use one slide to give you a quick overview of how we do it uh, and happy to answer questions if you want to know more about the details. So we usually start a baseline energy and emission projections, basically saying if nothing is going to change, if we, if we stick to business as usual, what will potentially happen in 2030 in terms of what kind of cars are going to run on the road and how much emissions are going to be associated with that. And then we estimate what if there will be more electric cars in the future? What will be the associated changes in the emissions of air pollutants and CO2? In order to make this calculation, we need to combine the activity data with how much emissions are associated with um, driving cars or um, producing electricity. And the next step is that we use, um, we want to quantify what are the associated changes in air pollution concentration? Because we know that cars and power plants, they emit primary emissions, and those emissions are going to react in the air um, to form actual air pollution. For example, fine particulate matters, PM2.5, that are very fine, so it can penetrate into your lawn and pose health um, implications. So the way we do this section is to use an atmospheric chemistry and transfer model called WARF Chem. Um, and just to show you like why we need to make, the, why we cannot really stop at emissions, why we need to take one step further to calculate this uh, air pollution concentration. What I'm going to show you here is just an animation of just like one random week that I use as an example, um, the first week of January in 2013. And this is the simulated hourly PM 2.5. 
And the concentration, um, uh, the colors here shows the concentration of PM2.5, the fine particulate matters um, in the surface layer. So you will see that even though the emissions in that we didn't really change that much, the associated changes in concentration of PM2.5 could really change dramatically. And this is because meteorology can play a critical role. So wind can transport pollution from one region to the other. And also when we have different relative humidity and different temperature, how fast the emissions can be turned into aerosols, turned into PM2.5 can also differ. And this is a key reason why we want to use a sophisticated air pollution model to really make the linkage between how your emissions are going to affect your PM2.5 concentration. And then let's move to the next step. The next step is to simulate the changes in human exposure. And for example, if our health endpoint of interest is mortality, then we want to use annual average PM2.5 concentration as a proxy for the average exposure level. So the final step is to, to calculate the changes in mortality. And the way we do it is to combine with the empirical evidence from epidemiology studies um, that that literature has really tried very hard to make the connection between how much more you expose to PM2.5 concentration, and this will lead to how much Incre how much increase in your mortality risk. So we combine with that public health evidence in order to really calculate if you change your whole human exposure, what does it mean for your mortality changes? So using this methodology, we want to really highlight um, two endpoints that is of interest. One is the air pollution objective. We use the metric air pollution related depth. And the other is carbon emissions, uh, and this is in order to capture the implications on climate. So the first set of results I want to highlight is that let's just take a look at national total and what if we use the current power mix in China to electrify about 30% of cars um, by 2030 for, for whole China. What we're going to find is that there will be some huge reduction, I think that's substantial, in air pollution related deaths. And this is because we reduce gasoline consumption and associated pollution in the transportation sector. But if you look at what is happening on the climate side, we don't see much changes in the carbon emissions. And this is because even though we reduce gasoline consumption and carbon emissions in the transportation sector, we need to produce electricity to charge those cars. And because here we assume the current power mix in China, we actually add more coal power generation in order to charge those like 30% of electric cars on road in 2030. As a result, that decrease in carbon emissions in the transportation sector is almost offset by the increase in the carbon emissions from the power sector. And that is what we're seeing here. If we look at an even more co-intensive part of China, for example, in Mongolia, this is a province that has a um, power made that is more carbon intensive than the national average, we see that, yes, um, there will be reductions in air pollution-related deaths, but we can actually see an increase in carbon emissions. And this is a situation where the increase in carbon emission from the power sector more than offset the reduction we can get from electrifying the transportation sector. So the key here is really combining the efforts to electrify the transportation sector with the efforts to decarbonize the power sector. So here we assume another scenario where we still electrify 30% the electric, uh, 30 of the cars, but now we charge them with a more decarbonized power mix, assuming only 50% coming from coal power. This is a reasonable target for China to achieve by 2030. So you will see the most substantial change here is that now we see green arrows downward substantially. So this means that we not only get slightly more air pollution reduction 
uh, in terms of the health damages, we also now can see substantial reductions in carbon emissions because now we get reductions in the transportation sector. We also don't see uh, increasing carbon emission from the power sector. So this is my first example, looking at the electric cars. And um, because of the second component really highlight the importance of decarbonizing the power sector, I'm going to continue to my second example that really focus on this key issue around electricity generation and transmission. So here comes my second example on the supply side. For those of you who have been following the energy news, you probably already know that China is now the green giant. So here on this figure, I'm showing the global new investment in renewables by region in the past um, five, 10 years or so. So you will see that China, which is here, we see a steady increase in renewable investment. And China is also now the top investor in terms of the amount of money invested in, in clean energy. Despite this really promising view, there's some other reason to be worried about um, China's electricity system that is the dominance of coal at present. On top of that, here I'm showing you the coal-fired power plants age by country. And you will see this red component is China. And you will see that for China, a lot of coal power plants are actually pretty young. They are less than five years old or 10 years old. Given that coal power plants generally have a few decades of lifetime, it means that this coal power plant, this new coal power plant here, are going to be there in the coming at least two decades. So it is critical for China not only to be satisfied with the green growth they have been having, but also think very critically about how they can manage the existing coal power plants. And that leads to the question we want to focus on. Remember, I talked about the coal being the central issue for carbon emissions, for air pollutant emissions, and also for cooling water use. So how can we manage China's coal power plants to address air pollution, water, and carbon objectives simultaneously? This is definitely a critical question, both for the energy investors, but also for the policymakers in China to consider. So because I've already highlighted the carbon component, um, previously, based, um, if you decarbonize the power sector, this is great for carbon. For, um, for this like, um, few, next few slides, I would just focus on these two local concerns, air pollution and water. And I want to highlight the potential trade-offs between these two local objectives. But before I do that, um, I just want to quickly remind us where China has air pollution and where China has water stress. So on these two figures, I'm showing you the level of environmental stress. The darker is the color, the more severe is the environmental problem. So you will see that for air pollution, it is the eastern part of China, and this like southwest, the Sichuan province, um, are more polluted than the rest of the country. In comparison, if you look at water stress, it is the northern part of China, broadly speaking, that are more severe in terms of their water stress level. And this is mainly because um, a supply story, for example, the Northwestern China, um, it has limited, it's a very dry area, limited precipitation. And play for places like um, Beijing, which is here, the Eastern, like here, um, this is both supply story and demand story because the population density in that area is pretty high as well. So the demand is high. But, just by looking these two geographic patterns side by side, you will already find that the regions China has air pollution is not exactly the same region that China has water stress. And if you think about some large infrastructures such as transmission that can cross provinces, you can already guess my punchline. That is the optimal air pollution oriented versus water-oriented transmission, transmission systems designs can differ. And we want to really highlight and quantify this potential um, trade-off using an engineering model. And the way we do it is to use an integrated assessment to design China's power system for air pollution as compared to water objectives. 
So again, we focus on 2030. Um, that is because this is a year China has is um, climate pledges to pick its carbon emissions by 2030 and also increase uh, increase the non-fossil energy uh, mix uh, share to 30 percent. So um, we in this paper specifically, we designed multiple futures for 2030. But in this presentation, I'm going to use just one possible future as an example. Happy to talk about the other scenarios and other implications. So this one scenario I'm using an example um, is based on the IEA World Energy Outlook 2017. And it is a fairly conservative scenario um, that projected by 2030, there's still 57% of generation, um, 50, 70, 57% from non-coal and the rest is still coming from coal. And the geographic pattern um, for this scenario is based on um, Chinese projections from the um, Energy Research Institute um, in China. And the method we're using is that here we use an optimization model um, and we focus on 2030 coal power plants um, both in terms of how much generation can happen, where those cow power, um, generation could occur, um, basically where to add new coal power power plants and where to retire those new coal power plants. And finally, configuration. Um, we know that we can install annual controls on power plants to reduce coal power, uh, the, to reduce the air pollution emission from coal power generation. We also know that we can re reduce the coal consumption and withdrawal from coal power plants by switching to dry cooling, basically using air rather than uh, water to, for cooling. Um, and since that, since the location of coal power, coal generation can happen, uh, can change, um, the interregional transmission can also change as well. So these are the main decision variables we are consider that could potentially change in 2030. And then our objective is to minimize the annual national total physical cost plus the environmental cost. The physical cost component is just the typical power system um, stuff like the generation cost and the transmission cost. What is really interesting here is more on the environmental cost. We include both air pollution costs and water costs, and we, because air pollution is an externality, so we monetize air pollution costs by multiplying the amount of emissions times the valuation for air pollution emissions. And this valuation can be considered as the damage cost associated with air pollution exposure. And for water costs, um, we monetize it by multiplying the amount of water consumption with a valuation for water. Because water is more like an economic product, so here um, the valuation for water, you can consider that as the water price. So it's a scarcity measure. Um, I should also say that here we monetize only water consumption, but we also impose a constraint in terms of the total water withdrawal. So, um, so the difference between water withdrawal and water consumption is that you can take the water in, but you can use the water for multiple times in your cooling tower before you let the water out. So water consumption is the total amount of water you withdraw, but water consumption is the amount of water that is evaporated during this um, electricity production process. So that's the difference. So water consumption is only a small, sub, small component of the total withdrawal. Both are important. We monetize water consumption and impose a constraint on water withdrawal. Okay, I'm almost certain that there will be questions about our methodology. Happy to take those questions in the Q&A. Okay, um, I wanna really highlight one result from this whole exercise. That is the difference between air pollution versus water orient, uh, air pollution versus water oriented transmission. So um, we start with existing environmental policies. This is basically the current um, air pollution emission charges and the current water price. We use the current pricing to monetize the water and air pollution costs I mentioned earlier. So you will see that um, if we go for the in existing environmental policies, we don't see much transmission happening. So that's why this figure is basically white. However, if we increase our valuation for air pollution to 20 times the present valuation, we're going to see a lot of transmission happening. Um, the orange area indicate import 
and the blue area indicate ACH board. So you will see we see a, a lot of ACH, a, a transmission from the um, northwest and northeast region to the eastern and central region. And this is because these two regions in orange are the highly polluted regions. So transmitting electricity from other regions to here is most valuable in terms of air pollution um, control. In comparison, if we hold the air pollution pricing at the current level, but increase the water price to 20 times the present level, you will see not, transmission, not much transmission happening as well. And this is because if we care more about water stress, this northern regions that is not only water stress, but also renewable abundant, they want to consume those electricity locally rather than transmitting them to other regions that are less water stressed. Finally, if we can increase both air pollution and water pricing, you will see this transmission pattern to be in between of an air only well, water only transmission design. So the key takeaway from this slide is that there are differences between air pollution and water oriented transmission. And these differences are important for grid planners to consider. So this is the end of my two, um, present, uh, two examples. I wanna um, take some step further to really think harder about what are the major takeaways? So as I said, I have an engineer hat and I have a policy hat. So wearing my engineer hat, I've already shown to you how we can use integrated assessment methods to analyze the synergies and trade off between multiple environmental objectives. The electric vehicle example showed you the synergies and trade off between air pollution and carbon. And the electricity generation and transmission example highlighted the potential trade offs between air pollution and water goals. And then the next step is what should we tell the policymakers, given that we already spent like years of efforts making these models work. So if we really think about how should China co-control air pollution and CO2, there are strategies that are potentially good for both objectives, but it's not always the case. So there are win-win strategies to co-control air pollution and CO2, such as reducing coal consumption, increasing renewables, improving energy efficiency, and also deploy some really new technologies such as burning coal and biomass together combined with carbon capture and, and storage. However, there are strategies that are good for air quality, but actually bad for carbon. For example, if we put more annual pipe controls on power plants or industrial plants, even though this is a great way to reduce the carbon emissions, using these devices are going to reduce the plant efficiency. As a result, increase the carbon emissions per unit electricity output. On top of that, there are like other strategies that are even worse, such as synthetic natural gas, converting coal to gas. This is a great idea for air pollution control because gas is cleaner compared with coal in terms of air pollution emissions, but this is a terrible idea for climate change. Because when you convert energy multiple times, you lose overall conversion efficiency and you increase your life cycle carbon emissions. Finally, there are strategies that are, that are case dependent. For example, China is building long distance transmission lines for air pollution control. This, this is a good way to reduce coal power generation and air pollution in the Eastern pollution centers. But whether or not it's a good idea for climate depends on are we transmitting renewable power or are we transmitting coal power? If these lines are used to transmitting coal power, it doesn't really matter where that coal power comes from because climate change responds to cumulative, cumulative carbon emissions. It doesn't really matter where that one unit of CO2 emissions come from. And another example that is case dependent is electric vehicles. I went into detail about the example earlier. So whether or not electric vehicle can also be a good idea for the climate, depends on uh, can we decarbonize the electricity sector fast enough so that we don't get the carbon offset in the, in the power sector. So given our understanding of this potential synergies and trade-off, it seems that policy suggestions are straightforward. So for those strategies, 
that are win-win. And those strategies such as NOPAP controls, this is a great thing for air pollution with only tiny bit of carbon penalty, just do it. And for those strategies that, that, that is really terrible for um, climate, con uh, climate concern, let's try to avoid. And finally, for those strategies that are case dependent, let's be strategic. But I should say that the real world is more complicated than just like three, three low, uh, slogans I wrote here. There were, so the ultimate question here is that there are near-term concerns and local concern, and at the same time, there are long-term concerns and a global concerns. So the real question here is, how much decarbonization can be achieved if we just rely on this local and near-term concerns around air pollution, around water, and around climate, uh, around the health? So I should say, from my perspective, there are reasons to worry. And this is because ultimately what we need is really deep decarbonization um, in order to tackle climate change. And deep decarbonization requires fundamental changes in the energy system, but air pollution can be solved largely without it. So luckily we have plenty of endopipe control strategies that can solve air pollution issue without touching the way we use energy. And on top of that, the marginal cost to squeeze coal out of the economy will increase as low cost options run out. So a Five years ago, they, China still had um, some of the less efficient and dirty coal power plants um, that those are the low cost options to squeeze coal out of the economy. But those small coal power plants have already shut, up, shut down. So right now, we, don't, we no longer have those low cost options, those low high fuels exist. So in the future, things are going to get trickier and more challenging if we want to reduce more coal from the energy system. In addition, as the air gets cleaner, the urgency to curb air pollution will reduce. It also means that there will be a smaller room if we just wanna tackle the climate co-benefits um, over time. However, I also think that there are reasons to be optimistic. Um, if China can continue and accelerate this clean energy transition, and there are like plenty of good news in this space, it will be a great thing for simultaneously addresses local and global concerns. Um, on top of that, it's in critical for China to coordinate the policies for air pollution, water, climate, and energy. I know I'm including a lot of issues in this, like, uh, in this one sentence, but coordination is really the key to ensure that we see uh, multidimensional benefits um, when we change the way you, we use energy. My final point is that um, there are some caveat as China, everything I talked about so far is really a domestic perspective looking within China. But um, climate change responds to global cumulative emissions. So it is not only important to look at what is China doing inside um, its political boundary, it's also important to think about um, the global implications of China's investments and activities. So there can be linkages between China's domestic and international activities. There are some concerns. Um, the domestic overcapacity might lead to more export of dirty coal technology to other countries. And there are linkages between the recipient country's local need with China's Go Global strategy. So what kind of technologies try China is going to invest in those recipient countries? Uh, it's not only a supply story, um, China also will respond to the demand depending on what uh, kind of local concerns those recipient countries have. So with that, I just wanna, uh, this is my last slide. Um, I just wanna quickly say that from my perspective, I think that there are, there's a huge potential in um, how we use energy so that we can integrate air quality, water, and climate concerns, everything simultaneously into the energy strategy. But the key is really we need to be smart and we need to really understand the potential synergies and trade off as well as how we can actually make it happen on the ground, given the institutional and policy context. So I also include my personal website and also my email here if you um, want to follow up after the presentation. So um, I'll just end here and happy to take questions.
Wonderful. Thank you, Wei, for uh, an excellent presentation. I think the best way to take questions would be that you will just write them in the chat window and then Wei can take them as they come. That way okay. we'll avoid any cacophony from multiple uh, comments. Okay. So where can you see it? I'm, I'm starting with my question. Yes, I have that in front of me. I actually have a question, yeah, from Johannes. <laughs> okay, so the question is, what do you think are the likely policies Chinese government will implement? So from my perspective, um, I think air pollution is one of the top government priorities right now. So um, my observation is that since 2013, Ch Chinese government is doing everything they can to tackle um, air pollution. So you will see that they start with anopep controls. Um, those are the typical first um, strategies people are going to implement. And gradually, um, they also uh, really focus on, for example, cap coal consumption and also increase um, electric vehicle renewable generation as a way to tackle air pollution as well. So from my perspective, I think the next stage, uh, so now it's already 2017 and uh, 2019, oh, I'm two years um, behind. Um, this is like 2019. And I really think that the next stage of, um, the next stage of air pollution control for China is really tackling the energy strategy. So um, I, what I'm saying is that air pollution is the top priority right now. So I think the likely policies that can be implemented um, immediately will be those really have air pollution benefits. But because um, I would say that China have already done those low hanging fruits and the next stage, I'm optimistic to see more energy oriented strategy being taken as well. Um, I hope I answered your question, Johannes. Feel free to um, follow up on that um, if I didn't really answer properly. The second question is from Chris. Um, you didn't address the role of natural gas in mitigating coal and the relative variable cost of coal and gas as related to renewable. Do you see natural gas in the mix as part of the solution or not a solution? Great question. I always get, get a question about natural gas. So I think um, let's get the record straight first. So China is not a country with a lot of gas resources. So they're having a lot of discussions about unconventional natural gas potential in China, like shale gas, but that didn't really take off, even though like people have been really um, talking about it since like 2011 or so. So I think the reason, um, I would say gas is part of solution, but I don't see gas as, uh, uh, I don't, personally, I don't think gas can play a critical role in China's clean energy transition, comparing with, for example, United States, where shale gas is much more available. Um, but I do want to emphasize that um, we, we worked on a really project looking at natural gas strategy for China. Um, and you will see that really depending on, even though the gas is small, um, really depends on which gas strategy China is going to turn to, there will be really different implications on water, air pollution, um, and carbon emissions. So we did a paper really looking at uh, multiple ways, such as China can imp using uh, gas pipeline from Russia or from Central Asia, or liquefy natural gas from Australia, where they can produce more conventional gas, where things like that, where they can do synthetic natural gas, converting coal to gas. Um, so you will see that converting coal to gas is the worst idea for um, carbon emissions, as I already talked about in the presentation. And in terms of the other like um, gas import route, um, really depends on where the gas is going to be used. Um, now the priority is in the residential, um, is in the residential sector, not in the power sector. Um, if, if China can do that, there is a great potential to have some air quality co-benefits because residential sector right now is a lot of the rural areas are using really dirty fuel. So to quickly recap my answer to this question, I see it as part of the solution, but not as a critical solution as compared to, for example, United States, where gas is much more abundant. Um, the next question is from Dao Jit. I hope I pronounced your first name correctly. How did you do the valuation for air pollution damages? Did you use value of life estimates? So um, this is a very specific question. Um, um, what we did in this paper is that we did a literature review um, through the, uh, and 
and see like what kind of valuation people have already done. And you're definitely right that the most commonly used method is using value of statistical life. And the idea, the, of course, there are like different ways to um, evaluate value of statistical life. The most commonly used way is willingness to pay studies. Um, so, um, so for example, they can, you, they, people can do surveys um, and asking questions in a way we can backtrack the information about how much more willing they would like to pay to reduce their mortality risk. Um, so, um, yes. So I guess, yes, we, uh, for this specific paper, we went through the literature and uh, many of them indeed use value of st statistical life estimate. So we also recognize that that has limitations because value of statistical life val uh, vary across country, vary across income groups, vary across like, like your social, your uh, belief system as well. Um, but we did our best to do that literature review. Okay, the next question is from Udaya. Uh, and the question is, could you elucidate the role of CCS, great question, uh, in view of managing energy security issues specifically? And are the costs of CCS in China similar or different than the global quoted cost? So I'm not entirely sure about CCS and energy security linkages. Um, I guess you're referring to if we have more CCS than um, then we car like coal power plants can exist in the carbon constraint world. So we don't need to import more energy from the other, from the rest of the world. If that's what you mean, um, I would say yes. I think, I personally think that I'm a very practical person. China just has so many coal power plants right there. And there are a lot of interest groups around coal and they need to survive. And in order to survive, CCS is, the most important technology for um, the coal industry to survive in a carbon constraint world. So I definitely see CCS critical. And to be honest, um, China is also a leading country in clean coal technology and also in um, CCS. In terms of the cost, so I see different cost estimates. Um, and, and I guess, Udaya, if given, if given that you are asking this question, you probably, have, you, you probably have already seen different numbers as well. So I think generally, um, China has lower cost comparing with like US and European countries. This is everything, but this is something everyone is going to agree. But um, China doesn't have very large scale like EOR, like enhanced oil recovery. Um, demonstration project comparing with the United States. I think there are only a, one or two sites going in China that's really looking at EOR um, as, a, a, as a good way to use the CO2 stream. So I would say that um, if, if, if we are talking about more from the technology cost, um, yes, I think China is lower comparing with the rest of the country, but I see a large uncertainty in terms of the deployment cost when we, when we actually think about the whole infrastructure and the value chain needed for CCS, not only capture, but also pipeline, transport, and utilization. Um, okay, next question is from Aston. From a global perspective, do you think African countries and other developing countries should give high priority to decarbonizing their energy system instead of developing cheap energy sources such as coal, which are readily available? Besides, rich countries used coal and fossil energy to industrialize and create wealth. An example is the proposed Lamu coal power plants in Kenya, which has attracted a lot of controversy. So I'm glad you're asking this question because um, I grew up in China and I think uh, my experience and how I, I started with my presentation with this, how things have changed in just 40 years in China. And I feel that economic growth is really the basic human right and um, I don't want to really argue against that. So I do want to, uh, I do want to say that um, a lot of people are talking about energy leapfrogging. And I think we need to be cautious not to take a condescending view when we talk about leapfrogging. But I do want to emphasize that um, now is a better time comparing with before if we want to talk about leapfrogging because the dramatic drop in cost for things like wind and solar. So um, I don't want to really comment specifically on one country or one power plant because that's, that there are always uh, political and social stories associated with each project um, that differ uh, from one to the other. But broadly speaking, I think um, reliable and um, cheap energy is the 
most important thing. And it's, um, I think the African countries um, should also see the, the uh, well, they could also view the current situation as a very promising stage where renewables are becoming um, more, um, uh, it's, become, it's becoming cheaper and more available. And whenever those strategies are possible, embrace it. Otherwise, you need to deal with what China is dealing with right now, like having a lot of coal power plants and think about, hey, we have a carbon constraint world and what, we should, what should we do with all the stranded assets? So the next question is from Abdalali. Um, the question is, as renewable and especially solar PV could play a big role in mitigating pollution and especially in residential sector, what do you think about the impact of large PV in roofs with regard to air pollution? We have two papers on this, um, and great. So first of all, um, there are two way, there are two linkages between air pollution and PV. The first linkage is what you're saying here. If we have more solar in the system, then we can reduce coal consumption, and we can reduce air pollution, we get health co benefits. What we find in this direction is that um, it is important to, to have the uh, transmission infrastructure for solar. Because um, in China, for example, solar is abundant in the north and west, but the demand center for electricity is to, uh, on the eastern side. So if we want to have like large scale PV, then we need to have the infrastructure in place for transmission. Or um, we can do what you are suggesting here, like having more rooftop PV. But if we have rooftop PV, then um, the, the the eastern part of China need to figure out a better way to price electricity so that this can create the economic incentive for, um, for residential users to actually install it and sell the electricity back to the grid. It's a long story, but a long story short, um, the electricity price in China right now doesn't really reflect the cost. And uh, even though there are some pilot programs to selling the electricity back to the grid, is because of the pricing system is not really flexible, is not, uh, we don't, we, we, we don't see like price signals as a good way to really um, facilitate action in that front. So this is the first linkage, how PV can affect air pollution. Another linkage is something I think people don't think it that often, that if you have air pollution, basically you block the sunlight. And when you block the sunlight, you reduce the amount of solar radiation that can reach the surface. And what we find is that this is a critical issue to consider when you install PV, rooftop PV in the eastern part of China, because that's also the region where air pollution is most severe. We find that in some months, um, that reduction in solar radiation because of air pollution can reduce up to 20 to 30% of the solar uh, potential in the eastern part of China. So um, you, you, you are going to, you can see a virtual cycle here. If you, re, uh, if you use more solar, you can reduce the air pollution. You can also increase the amount of solar radiation reaching the surface and, surface, and that increase the amount of um, solar generation you can get. So this is really a virtual cycle. That was a long answer. Um, the next question is from Chris um, about CCS. Um, how does the cost of coal generation per megawatt hour, including CCS, compared to the cost of generation for CCGT, gas, and solar in China? So um, this is a great question, um, but I feel that it's hard to really have an apple to apple comparison for the things you're talking about here. So let's start one by one. When we're talking about coal with CCS, we're talking about base low energy. Uh, when we're talking about um, gas, um, in China, because I said, we're not using, we don't have that much gas. And I think the um, gas share in the power sector, don't quote me on this, but I think it's definitely lower than 5% in the total electricity generation. So we're not using gas for like base low generation. In China right now, gas is meaning um, to shape the peak or provide the ancillary services. And then in terms of the solar, um, I think all of you know that solar is intermittent, so we don't get power when solar power when we act when we need it um, every time we need it. So solar right now is um, still just a few percent of the total generation, and again, it's not a um, base load generation. So if you are talking about levelized cost of electricity, so this is one of the common metrics people have been using. This is the annualized um, cost for technology that consider both your capital cost, your um, operational cost, and also um, 
Uh, also some discount rate like about like how your future costs can be monetized in, your, in the present value. If you use levelized cost of electricity, there are regions in China where the LCOE for solar is comparable to coal and gas. But as I said, I really don't think levelized cost of electricity is a very good metric because these um, type, this different type of sources are going to play a different role. And from my perspective, um, it's really about like this overall systems cost and that overall system costs also vary across regions. Like, do you count electricity transmission costs as part of the solar cost or not? So um, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you a specific yes or no or like um, higher or lower answer because I think this is really complicated and it's really like region specific. Um, yes, and same thing for CCS. If you're only talking about the capture part, then uh, it increased the cost, uh, the levelless cost of electricity by about, about 20% also. But again, that's only the capture component. Do you consider the um, CO2 transport? Do you consider um, the, the, the storage? Do you consider that cost as part of the um, coal with CCS cost? I think those are the, like, the trickier part of the question. Okay, so I rushed a lot but I don't see more questions in the chat window. Oh, I, I have one uh, from Johannes. Um, are you optimistic about China's ability to control NOx from coal-fired power plants and industry? Yes, I am. So um, for those, just to give all of you a little bit of contact, it is almost always the case that a country are going to start with SO2 control um, because it's cheaper um, and it's easier to monitor and then move to NOx control. So if you look at the current, if you look at the trend, you will see that the SO2 uh, emissions are decreasing really rapidly. And the NOx control really depends on which region you're talking about. It's decreasing um, in recent year, but not to the scale as, um, scale as SO2. I am optimistic because I really think if Chinese government want to do something, they can achieve it. And given air pollution is so, um, obvious and it is really a top government priority, I do think they're going to invest a lot of attention and resources to making sure that the next pollutant um, like NOx is going to be regulated and monitored in a good way as well. So it might take more longer time than the time China used to tackle SO2, but I'm still optimistic. So Johannes, if you're asking more specifically, I'm definitely more optimistic about China compared to India in terms of this enforcement of NOx control. Okay, so now I think I've gone through all the questions. Oh, CCS from Aston. Is CCS really viable and scalable seeing as it requires a carbon price that exists a cost of CCS? Currently, the cost of CCS is higher than carbon prices offered by government. Of course. So I, I definitely agree with you. I think everyone agrees that CCS needs a very high carbon price to make it happen. And it's definitely not the, I think the carbon um, pilots program in China, we're talking about a 10-ish, at least the price uh, at a range of like $10 per ton. So that's definitely not the range we uh, really need um, we really uh, need to like enable CCS deployments. So I would say I don't see carbon price as the, um, the, the most important trigger right now to build the demonstration plan. Um, I do see carbon price as the most important um, facilitator when CCS reached the large scale stage. So um, for CCS in China, there are a couple of demonstration plans. And I, as I mentioned just now, I do think um, even though the capture component has been uh, demonstrated, I would say pretty well, especially in China, there is one plant in Tianjin, um, which is the IGCC plant coupled with CCS, which is actually one of the uh, most promising plant um, demonstrating that technology around the world. But I do see um, really, re uh, really the, the logistical challenges along the value chain is difficult. Carbon taxes are gaining, of, uh, this is another question from uh, Chris. Carbon taxes are gaining currency in Europe and North China. Is China considering implementation of a tax or fixed price for carbon in any form? Um, yes. So I think since 2017, I think it's since 2017, China started um, cap and trade. Oh, let me take a step back, fixed price. Oh, if you're asking about tax versus cap and trade, then um, I have a more subtly different 
question. But let me start with like a price on carbon, and then I'm going to go into this um, cap and trade versus tax thing. So um, if you're talking about putting a price on carbon, yes, since 2017, China started to pilot this cap and trade system in a few provinces and cities. I think right now only coal powers, uh, only power sector and major industrial sectors um, I consider it's not still not an economy wide um, cap and trade system, but I think it lays the foundation for the market mechanisms we need in order to um, in order to really strengthen the ability of carbon markets in the future. If you are asking more specifically about about carbon tax, like as the form of policy instrument, I think the discussion about tax is less comparing with the discussion of, about cap and, cap and trade because cap and trade is already in the um, pilot program. So I would also say that in, uh, in most countries, tax is viewed as more negatively comparing with market mechanisms. This is true for China as well, even though you probably would, as, would assume that for um, top-down system, maybe tax is more, um, more um, acceptable. But still, if you talk about cap and trade system, people are generally more um, uh, uh, acceptant because the cost is like hidden <laughs> in the market mechanism as compared to tag, you see the actual number. So um, I would say yes, China is, uh, is experimenting putting a price on carbon, but right now the priority is on cap and trade as compared to tax. Okay, excellent. Thank you everybody for a, a great discussion. This was, at least for me, this was very insightful and uh, I'm, I'm glad to see such active participation in the seminar. We are uh, running out of time now, so uh, thank you, Wei, for taking the time to uh, give us the insights on China. And uh, our next webinar will be in January. We will send out the emails and materials on it, and it's going to look at uh, coal-fired power generation in India. Thanks, everybody, and see you next time. Yeah, thank Bye -bye. you, everyone. Thanks for the great discussions and questions.